So welcome everyone. And uh, let me welcome Dr. Roseanne Leipzig, who has written this book, uh, Honest Aging. And Roseanne, I, ha I hate to give everyone's background. I know it's boring, but if you could tell us a little bit about yourself, your hospital affiliation and things like that, just sure. to kick it off. Sure. I'm a uh, professor at the Mount Sinai School of Medicine in geriatrics and palliative medicine. And um, I've been here for 25 years. I've been in geriatrics uh, for about 40. It's been my specialty since I finished residency. Excellent. And so uh, what we'll do is uh, I will ask uh, questions. We'll, we'll make it like a Q&A format. And if those of you in the audience have questions, uh, you know that we're recording the session. So if you don't want to be seen, you can type your Q&A in the uh, Q&A section or the chat section. And uh, I will, uh, uh, you know, for, you know, gear them uh, to the interview and send them to Dr. Leipzig. And, uh, and, uh, or if you raise your hand, and you want to be seen asking the question, uh, you click the raise hand feature in the reactions tab at the bottom of the screen. Uh, and we will uh, highlight you asking the question. So, um, uh, Dr. Leipzig, I, uh, I actually I googled some of your books. I was I wanted to see. Oh, did is Dr. Leipzig uh, uh, an author of many of these books? And I see that previously books were geared towards the medical profession, such as prescribing for older adults, geriatric medicine. Uh, so. This is not your first book, but is this your first patient facing or public facing book? And what inspired you to write it? <laughs> it is my first uh, public facing book. Um, <clears throat> it's really facing everybody who is thinking about growing old, which hopefully is most of the people on this webinar um, and most of the people in the world. Um, I have done writing for. Um, uh, non-medical audiences, I have a um, uh, newsletter for the past 20 years called Focus on Healthy Aging, which um, gives short uh, answers to short questions and uh, in-depth discussions of things that are going on that people who are aging uh, would like to know about. Um, what got me to write this book? Well, probably the biggest thing is the questions everybody asks me whenever they find out what I do for a living. Okay, it doesn't matter where I am. I can be um, sitting on a plane. I can be at a cocktail party. I can be um, at the synagogue. And people will come up to me and tell me a story and say, is this normal? Okay, is this what I should be expecting? Should I worry about this? Should I see somebody about this? And I realized we really need to give people the information they need kind of like the people who wrote what to expect when you're expecting for pregnancy. We need, needed something like that for aging. And so that was really the impetus for me to try and put this together in a way that people would understand that there are changes that are going to occur um, as you age, um, that normal may be normal, meaning it happens to everybody or to most people, but it's not normal in terms of you might still want to do something about it or change, um, do whatever you can to change it. So that was the impetus for the book. Right. Well, along those lines, um, are, the, are there differences between normal signs of aging and changes that should not be overlooked or accepted? Absolutely. Um, and even some of the normal signs of aging should not be overlooked or be accepted. And just an example of that, which I found really important, um, when I was in training, we didn't treat high blood pressure, systolic high blood pressure, the top number in older adults. We were taught, even if it was 200, okay, we were taught that if we brought that down, we might cause a stroke. And then studies were done. And we learned that actually 
they're third, you decrease strokes by a third, you decrease heart failure by a third, and now we all treat people with high blood pressure. And 90% of 90 year olds have high blood pressure. So this is an important thing. It's normal, okay, but it's not good for you. Okay. So my bottom line is if there's something that is distressing to you or interfering with your ability to do what you want to do, then you should discuss it with your medical provider because there may be things that you can be doing that will help you do what you want to do and not feel sidelined. Mm. And can medical professionals provide a more forward thinking approach to the issues that are facing their aging patients? I think they can. I think um, they're, they're receiving more education than they were, but it's still far from optimal. Um, and they live in the same society we all live in, which is an ageist society. And I know you've talked about that on other programs for coming of age, but it's a huge concern. And I get a lot of patients who come to me because they feel blown off by their primary provider. Um, they're not being listened to. And I think it's an obligation of all of us patients and doctors and the medical education establishment to try and get doctors to better understand what's normal, what's not, and how to help people as they age. Going back to the uh, 90 plus uh, individuals who ha typically have high blood pressure that's treatable, what happens when we age, the good and the bad? <laughs> that's that's the book um okay that's the book <laughs> um but i guess i think about it my my tagline is aging begins at birth okay and when i speak to the medical students i always kind of get these wide eyes when i say to them lots of things peak in your 30s okay your muscle mass peaks in your 30s your ability to learn lists of words peaks in your 30s, and that's really important for medical students and anybody else who's studying, okay, that there are a number of things that peak in your 30s, your bone density. And from then on, it's a slow decline, all right? The good news is that you can do things to maintain your well-being during that time, that dementia, frailty are not inevitable, okay? Um, frailty in particular is something that only 25%, only a quarter of people who are over 85 have. And there are things that you can do that can help with that. So frailty is not something that's inevitable. It is <laughs> not. Actually, inevitable. things that we can do. Yes. Okay. How did you get started working with uh, older people and 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 I hear that you've also worked for their rights. How did yes. you get started with that? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, I started working for older people. I wouldn't quite call it working for older people, but my grandmother lived with us. Working with. Working, working with, with, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so my grandmother moved in with us um, when I was a child, and she had had colon cancer and had a colostomy. And this is back in the 50s. Colostomies are the... Um, they take, when you have colon cancer, they would take your colon out and put a bag in, okay? And that's where the waste would collect and then you would have to empty the bags. It, the bags were not great in those days and it was a real difficult situation, but she was alive and she was able to have a life. And she made an incredible life for herself like that. And she lived with us for about eight years and then she turned 75 and she said, okay, that's it. I wanna go back with my friends. And she moved into an apartment where her friends were living. And, you know, we saw her all the time, but she, you know, made a life for herself. And after that, uh, several years after that, she had a recurrence of the cancer and she ended up having to live in a nursing home. And I saw the kind of care that was given and I would spend a lot of time with her there. Um, and so that whole experience 
had a major impact on how I feel about older people and the wisdom of older people and the resilience of older people. Um, and I think that it's interesting in our field, when we interview people who want to go into geriatric medicine, there's almost always a grandparent there. Yeah, being uh, social, you know, having a network, uh, those are very healthy for, uh, you know, for longevity, quite frankly. Do we as older adults have a problem with the idea of aging and living our lives to the fullest? <laughs> like your grandma. I wish I could say yeah. no. <laughs> yep. Absolutely. Um, a lot of people are in total denial. Okay. Um, they think that their lives are just going to keep going as they are, and then they're not going to wake up. <laughs> and that happens to very few people. What really happens is that there's subtle changes and some not so subtle that occur as you get older that affect all parts of your life. And if you know what to expect, you there are things you can do about it and things you can change. I mean, one of the things you really have to do is be adaptable. And that's when I'm talking to people at all ages, because we can be rigid <laughs> when we're 20, when we're 40, okay? And that rigidity does not help as you get older, because stuff happens, you have to respond to it, you're not in control, and to be creative and flexible and adaptable really makes a huge difference in how you age. And if I can just add an, a, a second part to that answer. Um, we're all ageist, okay? And being ageist means that we have a stereotype of what older people are like. And oftentimes it's not flattering, okay? It's that people are less capable, less able, less um, cognitively intact, all of those sorts of things. Um, and if we treat people that way, or if people feel that way about themselves, it can turn into a self-fulfilling prophecy. So really, to try and get positive images of aging from, like I had with my grandmother, okay, from the very beginning, makes a huge difference. Um, so that's one thing that we really can do to try and help ourselves thinking about getting older. Do you think that our understanding of aging has grown at the same rate as the actual possibilities for living while we're aging have grown? Unfortunately not. <laughs> um, I think there have been amazing things that have happened in my lifetime in terms of what we now understand about aging what we can do about aging. You know, in the last 30 years or so, there's been a huge decline in people dying from heart disease, okay, at younger ages. When I was growing up, it was not uncommon at all for 55-year-old men to drop dead from heart problems. Now it's extremely uncommon unless, you know, there's, um, they haven't been getting medical care because we figured out ways to prevent that, or at least to move it to a later stage of life. So I think um, the idea of being, um, trying to, to come back to your question, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's that senior moment. Um, you, the idea that the, um, advances that have been made let us live longer. There's a lot of stuff out there talking about 80 being the new 60, 80 being the new 50. Certainly older people are healthier and more functional than they were when my grandmother was this age. Um, and that has to do with a lot of things, medical, social, education. However, we haven't caught up with it. We haven't caught up with it in the way we look at aging for ourselves. We certainly haven't caught up with it in terms of preparing for our own aging. It's really nice to hear that PSS has uh, residences for older adults because that's a huge problem and that does not exist in many, many places. Mm. 
if there were a question that you would want us to focus on, or more than one question, about uh, getting older that we rarely think about, when do you think we should be asking ourselves? Well, you know, we ask kids and young adults, what do you want to do when you grow up? And we spend a lot of time counseling them, spend a lot of time figuring out should they go to college and what college they should go to. That's a big thing. And college only lasts, lasts about four years, okay? We don't do anything like that about retirement, about what are you going to do after you stop working? And that in this day and age is not uncommonly a 30-year period, 20, 30 years. Um, a sad story, I had a patient the other day who came in miserable, and I was trying to talk to him, and he was, it was hard to get words out of him, and he finally said, you know, I'm just so unhappy, I don't know what to do with myself, you know, this retirement is just not working for me. This was mid-October, okay, and I said to him, when did you retire? September 1st. Now, <laughs> It's not like that was a surprise, okay? He knew for a very long time he would be retiring September 1st, but he couldn't bring himself to think about the, what happens beyond that moment. So I think we really need to start um, thinking about what do we want to do to have an engaged and meaningful third act, okay? Okay. So how can can planning for our old age enhance our experience of that time in our lives? You know, what should we consider uh, when we're planning? Uh, I've heard of the three-legged stool, uh, legal, um, financial, and, and then the emotional piece. How do I want to spend my time? I think the legal and the financial are important, without a doubt. I think none of us know what's gonna happen in the future. We need to have somebody who can speak for us if we're unable to speak for ourselves, like a healthcare proxy. And they need to know what we want. It's not any good to just write a name down, okay? You really have to have a discussion about what do you want? Because this person is gonna be acting in your name and they shouldn't be acting in their own name. And if they know what you want, it's much more likely that that will happen. Okay, and that your wishes will be carried out. Um, the emotional, I think, is important, but it's a it's a complex piece. Um, and I would put a fourth leg on that stool, which has to do with the medical. Okay, obviously that's what I deal with. Um, the emotional is interesting because everybody thinks that older people are more likely to have major depression, to be sad, to be anxious. The studies really don't show that. And in fact, older people in general are more likely to be able to control their emotions. They're less likely to have intensely negative emotions, outbursts, okay? Some people call this the paradox of aging. And it's probably because you realize that there's, there's an expiration date. You don't know what it is, but there's only so many years. And is it worth it to spend the energy <laughs> getting so angry about something when it's not going to have that big a consequence on your life. You've also had all these years to learn coping mechanisms and ways to deal with things. So I'm not saying older people don't get intensely emotional and intensely negatively emo emotional, but I am saying it doesn't happen as often as it does for younger people or it does for them when they were younger. Okay. So I think the emotional has a lot to do with the situational as well. What situation do you find yourself in? So I think a lot of women kind of go through this in empty nest time, okay? And more and more women are going through it like men have gone through it when they stop working. Who am I? Am I going to be, you know, have diminishing relevance in this world? How do I keep from doing that? And the answer to that, I think, depends on you and what you'd like to do, okay? What is it you haven't been able to do? Or is there something new you'd like to take up? 
I mean, I've been looking on the internet. There are all these people who started new things when they were 70. You know, it's not just the people who were able to do great things and then continued doing it until they were 100. You know, the George Burnses of this world, you know, the comedians do a good job of that. But it's people who start something totally new. I'm going to be a bodybuilder. I'm going to be a singer. I'm going to be um, get into politics, climate change, um, get to know my grandchildren better. I want to, you know, things of that nature, give back to the institutions or the groups that have been important to you in your life. Um, it's critical to have things to look forward to and things that are going to give meaning to your life at every stage of your life. So that's my, my biggest push on the emotional. On the medical, um, don't let it overrun your life. <laughs> you know, we doctors have infinite numbers of things that we can suggest that you should be doing. This test, that test, you know, take this medication, check this out. Really start thinking about what is the purpose of your medical care. And the purpose of your medical care is to serve you, the person. It's not to have a perfect hemoglobin A1C, blood pressure, cholesterol level. It's to allow you to do what you want to do. And if it's getting in the way, then you really need to think about it and about whether these are things that you should be doing. Yeah, in terms of medical care, are there identifiable steps that you feel every patient who's getting older, entering their older years, should take on their own behalf? Yeah, I do. <laughs> um, <laughs> I think the first thing that you should do is if you are taking medications, and I consider medications to be prescription, over-the-counter, supplements. Everybody's taking marijuana in some form these days, okay? So any of those, to have a session with your primary care provider and say, do I need these? Do I still need to be taking all of these? And if I do, do I still need to be taking them at the doses that I'm taking them? Because as you get older, oftentimes you get more bang for the buck with medications and a lower dose will give you what you need. A higher dose will give you side effects. And the best example of that, although some people don't consider this a medication, is alcohol. You know, it takes far less alcohol to get you to that nice place where you'd like to be when you're older than it did when you were younger. And if you still take your two drinks, three drinks a day, you're more likely to fall, to get confused, to have you know, a bad outcome from that, a car accident. So I think medications are something, and doctors don't like to just stop medications because they think patients are gonna get upset or the other doctors who prescribe them are gonna get upset. And things change over life. You may have been told you're gonna to have to take this medication for life. We just saw this with aspirin, okay? Everybody was taking aspirin because of their heart to prevent heart disease. And then the study was done a few years ago, looking now at people who are 60, 70 and older and the benefits of taking an additional aspirin on cardiovascular health, on dementia, on longevity um, versus not in a randomized trial, a very high level trial. And it showed not only no benefit, it showed an increased risk of bleeding in older people. So you kind of sit there and you say, now, have my doctors been wrong all these years? What's, what's been going on? And the answer is not that they've been wrong. The answer is that we have changed the other things that we do. We've got your blood pressure more controlled. We've got your cholesterol more controlled. You know, we're doing different things. That baby aspirin does not provide the um, added benefit in 2022 that it provided in 1965, okay? So yes, it was forever, but things change. And you should go through your medications once a year with your doctor about that. Oh, I remember that, yeah. And, and I remember my doctor telling me, it's probably not good for you to take aspirin, not because of this new thing, but because of another um, condition that uh, would be cropping up. 
Mm-hmm. So, uh, you know, but, it, yeah. but, but then this new study came. So that's really interesting. Um, so going back to uh, when you were talking about planning for one's aging, what is the biggest impediment um, that people have in, in uh, doing that in planning for their aging, do you think? I think it's our mindset. I think we just don't think it's going to happen to us. Um, and that's partly why I wrote the book, because I think people should know what to expect. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, and I have people who come in all the time <laughs> saying to me, you know, they're doing perfectly well. What they want is to get rid of the pot belly. Okay. I don't do liposuction. I wouldn't recommend it, but <laughs> it's something that, you know, really bothers people. But it's part of what we now see as normal aging. There's a change in the composition of the body. Unfortunately, we become more fat, less muscle, okay? And because of that, and where the fat distributes is different. So you'll notice as you get older that your arms get thinner, that you're able to see the veins in your hands more, you lose your subcutaneous tissue, but you get that belly, okay? And there's not a whole lot that you can do about it. You can try and lose a little weight. You can exercise and try and get those abs, you know, do some Pilates. Um, But that's normal aging, okay? Uh, Excellent. Uh, Just to put put a little plug in for uh, PSS USA events, I'm gonna put that in the chat. Uh, You can click on them pssusa.org slash events. And one of the uh, events that we have is called Explore Your Future, which actually touches upon the emotional leg of the now four-legged stool, that's good to know, (laughs) where we talk about how do I want to spend my time uh, in these years? How do I plan for it? What are my goals? You know, starting with where, how did I get here? Where am I, who am I today? And then looking at what what goals, dreams, values, and aspirations we have. So that's one. And then uh, you were talking about exercise. We have a, uh, a new uh, exercise class called Fit After 49. And if you go to that link, which will be on pssusa.org slash events, uh, watch the video because the instructor is a 70 year old who does this gentle exercise that's for all fitness levels. And you can see what his existing uh, clients have to say about how it invigorates them, how they feel, how it uh, helps uh, energize them for the rest of their day. Uh, And we have several other events happening uh, in the middle of the month. Um, So, so it all kind of bolsters and supports what you've been telling us. Um, now you advocate not only for patients, but for their caregivers and their children. Is How is aging a multi-generational issue? Um, it's interesting because oftentimes as you get older, you know, we, we live in a very independent um, world one where we value our independence, we don't want anybody telling us what to do, um, things like that. And, you know, aging is really, uh, it takes a village and it affects the whole family. It doesn't just affect the person who is aging. Um, And you can't pretend that it, it does. And this is true for both positive and negative interactions, you know. Um, some of the issues that come up are going to be very sensitive um, and contentious even. Uh, They may be embarrassing. And it's really important for the older person to think about how the younger person is looking at this and for the younger person to think about how the older person is thinking about this. You, You really have to kind of have a meeting of the mind and take into account each other's point of view when you're talking about decision-making. I mean, you can be like one of my patients who was just adamant. She was not leaving her home, okay? And she fell and she fell and they called EMS and all of this. We could not get her to leave her home. 
And we actually had a meeting with her and her four kids talking about this, where they all finally understood that she didn't care if she fell and died on the floor of her home. She didn't want to leave and she didn't want anybody coming in. And that's who she had been her whole life. <laughs> okay, <laughs> she'd been ornery forever. And so we kind of came to an agreement and actually even wrote it down and said, this is what Helen wants. Um, and that is what came to pass. She got her wishes. You know, um, it's hard. It's very hard. There are other times when you realize that somebody's really depressed. And if you could get the depression under control and have them feel that there's more to life by letting other people help them, that they're able to do the things that they want to do, um, they are willing to try and do those things and, and have a life. You know, it's kind of like glasses. We don't think about glasses because they're around all the time. Had I been brought born when there weren't glasses, I wouldn't have made it to five, okay? <laughs> but it's, it's adaptive equipment, just like a cane is adaptive equipment or a wheelchair or a walker or hearing aids, okay? Um, there are people who say that, and this is not, yeah, this is multi-generational as well <laughs> um, because people make fun of people who can't hear. They don't think that they're with the program. Whereas there are some older people who think they look old if they're wearing a hearing aid. And I can assure them that you look a lot older um, if you're not able to participate <laughs> in the conversation and what's going on. So if you look around the streets right now, everybody's got something hanging out of their ears. You know? Right. <laughs> so if we start making hearing aids that look like that, <laughs> you know, maybe everybody will feel more comfortable wearing hearing aids, but they can really make a huge difference. Uh, but it takes everybody in the family working together to get somebody to feel comfortable with some of these changes. Yeah. Oh, that's interesting about hearing aids because uh, I, I wear them and people don't notice. They make them uh, so, in, you know, invisible, like imperceptible right. uh, to, yeah. to folks. Um, and I said, I, I want to hear... Uh, and I don't care if it looks like a giant seashell on the side of my head, because I, I want to hear. <laughs> yeah. I found so, myself doing this, you know, uh -huh. and one of my great nieces said to me after I got my hearing aids, what's different? You're not doing this anymore. <laughs> I said, mm -hmm. whoops, <laughs> I hadn't been aware. <laughs> yeah. After people read your book or see this webinar, what mind shift do you hope you can help readers or viewers make between accepting new deficits as the inevitable part of getting older and learning to embrace uh, adjustments and aids and you know other solutions uh, as enhancements to life? I think what I want them to do is think about people who are role models for them in aging well, okay? And they don't have to be celebrities. They could be my, my bubby, my grandmother, uh, you know, um, but some but thinking about people who really have taken this on as their next challenge and looked at it from with a glass half. I always get the empty and full confused. A, a glass half, half full, not a glass half empty. OK, no, you may not be able to do what you were able to do before. So a friend's father decided at 80, he was going back to the gym. And he was really upset that even though he was making progress, he was nowhere near what he was able to do when he was a Marine. OK, and I, I said to him, listen, there are 20 year olds who win the Boston Marathon. There are 80 year olds who win the Boston Marathon. The 80 year olds take longer, but they win the Boston Marathon for their age group, you know. You have to realize you may not be able to get back to where you were, but you certainly get can get better than where you are now. And I think that's the thing. Don't stop challenging yourself. You know, keep trying to do um, to make adaptations that will allow you to do more and recognize all of the people who who have done that. They're good models. 
Yeah, and I would definitely consult with you or my doctor uh, before I took on a marathon uh, or an exercise uh, program. Uh, fortunately for me, my doctor says, yes, go to the gym, exercise. Yeah. Well, you know, exercise, <laughs> so, is yeah, the only, do it. exercise is the only magic bullet we have for aging. Okay. Mm -hmm. It improves mm -hmm. mood. It improves sleep. It improves cardiovascular. Um, you know, it's got so many positives to it. And I'm a couch potato. I will be the first to admit it. But I have started walking a whole lot more and being out in the sunshine a whole lot more. And it really helps. And there are studies that support this. Yeah. One of the exercise instructors for coming of age was saying, um, you have to be careful what advice you give people about weight bearing exercise. For example, if they have osteoporosis, like really consult the doctor because we know that it, that weight bearing exercise can strengthen bones. But if you have osteoporosis, you know, we're not really, uh, I think we need to talk to you. <laughs> okay. The truth is that weight-bearing exercise can help with osteoporosis, but so does strength training, okay? So resistance exercises, you know, lifting up and all of that, even if it's a can of soup, okay, <laughs> just starting with something can help. Um, but yes, check with your doctor to see what you shouldn't be doing, because some people with osteoporosis, there are certain exercises you really shouldn't be doing. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. In your decades long practice in this field, what have been the largest shifts in the perception of what aging is that you have seen? Um, I think the baby boomers are making a huge difference. Um, you know, I, and on TV, okay, you see people like, Jane Fonda and, and Lily Tomlin, Martha Stewart, okay? Um, and, you know, there are many men. It's, it's been unusual to see older women um, really out there on TV. Um, so I think that that's one of the biggest changes I've seen is people be, feeling empowered to say, this is what AD looks like, okay? And I'm going to do what I can. Um, and fighting back against terms like the gerontocracy that leads this country. Yes, the people who are leading this country are older. Yes, there may be good reasons to have younger people involved. Okay, they're going to live <laughs> uh, in the world created. But simply the fact that somebody is older should never be a reason that you dismiss them. And I think we all have to work hard at being upstanders, I guess, is the term that people use when you hear that kind of language. And I think that's starting to happen. So I think there's there's a shift. And I like to say, you know, it's from ageism to honest aging, you know, not saying um, you got to be 20 years younger or, you know, 80s, the new 60 or anything like that. But this is what it is. This is what I'm going to live with. Get a grip on it, you know and figure out what you can do that's gonna make your life meaningful and fun. Yeah, and going back to another topic you were on, uh, the, the, the kind of stubborn or ornery person, yes. that, you know, who didn't care if she uh, fell down. <laughs> uh, it's interesting because, uh, you know, I'll be speaking to my parents who are in their eighties and I, personally think that their responses and their wants and wishes are really odd. My late aunt uh, would tell them, you need to learn to accept help, accept help. Uh, I had to do it, she, she would say. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I don't know, I think uh, people push it away. 
Um, and the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. So I don't know <laughs> what I'll be like, you know, when I'm their age, right. you know, because I'm thinking, oh, yeah, I'll, I'll take the help. Sure. But yeah. I don't know how I'll be. <laughs> and, and the help, it depends on what we're talking about. OK, so we are lucky enough to live in an age where technology is helping us compensate for some of the early signs of aging. OK, um, figuring out a root in your head. Is, gets tough as you get older. GPS is everywhere, okay? Figuring out the tip, okay? Doing that kind of mental calculation. You know, you go to the restaurant, now they tell you, this is a 10%, this is a 15%, this is a 20, maybe you wanna give a 30, you know? But it's there to help you. Um, quicken in, the, in those sorts of money things that, that balance your checkbook for you so you don't have to balance it yourself, you know? Um, so there are things that are really making life easier in those ways. It's the stuff that's personal care that gets harder, okay? Because as you get older and if your balance is not so good, if you're having a lot of falls, that can be tough. And you may need to have somebody in to help out, whether it's with you know simple cleaning around the apartment or doing cooking or, or your house. I guess some people do live in houses. Uh, I'm a New Yorker, um, but also having somebody to be with you and getting the right person can be very hard. Our healthcare system is not set up to make it easy to get somebody who is right for you, but you should really try to get somebody who you feel comfortable with, who you can enjoy being with, um, and have them do things with you. If, if it's hard for you to get out of the house by yourself, Get out of the house with them, go to a movie, go to a museum, you know, go to a social club and just, you know, be able to have a life. That's really the purpose. It's not who's with you or who's helping you. It's being able to feel like this is a good life. I'm enjoying myself. You know? Yeah. And it, it seems that uh, the COVID pandemic and the lockdown uh, changed not only the medical profession, but the way that we behave, sometimes uh, to our own detriment. Do you have any uh, thoughts yes. about that? I do, because I think it has become very hard for people to leave their homes. Um, <laughs> And it's just, nobody wants to come to work anymore. Everybody wants to work from home. And I am, you know, I'm more than glad not to have the commute. <laughs> so I understand that. Um, but also even to just get up and go outside, we've just gotten very used to being in the house. And that's why when I say I really work at getting myself out, taking a walk, getting out in the sun, it isn't easy. And having somebody to do it with you so this is where families can be very helpful. You know, when you visit your parents, you know, suggest let's go for a walk. You know, let's um, do something outdoors. Get you out um, can be really helpful. Because I agree, um, the isolation has caused so much uh, depression, so much uh, despair, and we've got to get over it. Yeah. Yeah, and outdoor. You know, originally, when it was first out there, when the when that virus was out there, it was uh, well, you know, if you're near somebody outdoors, it's really about. But now it's like okay, social distance outdoors for sure. Mm -hmm. But outdoors is one of the safest uh, places you could be besides your own home if you're right. not in close proximity to somebody that has COVID. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so yeah, so uh, go outdoors, definitely. Yeah. yeah. Anyone out there uh, have a question? It's been uh, pretty quiet in the uh, Q and A in the chat, so uh, we would like to open it up for chat. If you're on the phone only, uh, you can press star nine to raise your hand, uh, and if you're on the uh, on the Zoom call with video, uh, you can either type in the Q&A or the chat or click the share screen button, raise your hand, uh, and we will uh, we'll put you on camera so that you can uh, ask a question. 
So we'll just give it a few seconds for that and um, see if there are any other. Oh, I, I have, here's a good one. Uh, I have a question. What, what advice can you give those who feel overwhelmed by uh, the caretaking of a parent? I think a lot of us out there are care, caregivers. Yeah. A lot are overwhelmed by the caretaking of a parent and they're also sandwiched with the caretaking of children which makes it even worse, you know? So the first thing I have to say is you gotta take care of yourself. Um, there are study after study shows that the caregivers can do worse than the person who's being taken care of. Um, and that this includes not just depression, but death, okay? So it's really, really important that you take care of yourself. And I'm not just talking about that from a medical point of view. I'm talking about it from an emotional point of view, from a social point of view. You've got to be able, just like we're telling your, the older people, you've got to be able to have a meaningful and engaged life. So whatever that is, um, make sure it happens. That's one. Two, try and um, pick your battles. Choose your battles, okay? Um, there are going to be a lot of things that you might not agree with, particularly in people, when people are starting to have trouble remembering things. There, it can be very upsetting. I mean, this is your mother. This is your father. They knew everything, okay? And now, not so much. And I see people who want to argue over, no, it was the fifth of the day of, of that month. It wasn't the sixth. Or, you know, um, it was 10 years ago. No, it was nine years ago. What difference does it make? Really think about what matters. And when you think about that, you know, having a good connection, is really what matters. Having a relationship is really ma what matters. And trying to understand why people are doing what they're doing on both ends um, is helpful as well. There are caregiver support groups. And if you are with somebody who has a specific illness in particular, or is grieving, finding a bereavement or a dementia caregiver support group can be really helpful. Um, things like the illness support groups, you're dealing with people who are dealing with exactly the same thing you are. And they come up with some really creative ways to uh, make things better in your life. So Yeah, and definitely make time for yourself. Yeah. I remember uh, I had a parent uh, in the hospital and I was there, you know, 24 seven for, almost a week and by by friday i was like uh, parents can i please uh have the weekend <laughs> off <laughs> yeah it was, like, yeah. It, it was really draining so if you're a caregiver and you're devoting you know 100 percent of your time it's just yeah it, you could burn out without uh, a doubt so, so easily here's a question uh from the audience what suggestions do you have that might be helpful to the gentleman who retired September 1 and was so unhappy in mid-October? So the first thing that I had to do was to figure out if he was clinically depressed, if that's what was going on, okay? And it turned out it wasn't. This was his personality, okay? He totally... Um, his vision of himself was all about his job and his position. And losing that just made him feel like not, he was nothing. So we actually began talking about, is there anything, you know, anything that could make you feel like life is worth living? And that's where we started and we brought his wife into it and we started talking about it. And they actually decided that at this point, while they both had their health, it was a good time to do some of the traveling that they had talked about and couldn't do because he was working all the time. And now they were in a situation where they could do some of that. And we started talking about bucket lists, you know, and what's on there and what do you want to do? Um, and so that's where they are at the moment, actually. Well, that's a good place to be. Yeah, yeah. And then so, 
then there's after oh go ahead no come on it's okay <laughs> I, I was going to say uh i know a lot of people when they first retire they go through this big travel phase and they're going all over all over all over then when the okay i think i'm i've i've traveled enough now what <laughs> Right. And so while you're traveling, you have to think about that. Okay. <laughs> it's a good time. You're away from everything. What can I do at home that would make life meaningful for me? Okay. Um, and so I have a cousin out in California and he retired from IBM and he became a first responder to all at 65 to all of the fires and the rain. And, you know, he, uh, he doesn't do the work. He's more administrative and it helps figure out who should go where and what should be done, but it's brought incredible meaning to his life. Okay. Um, other people do very different things. It's very personal. You know, I have some guys where golf is the world. <laughs> you know, I have a 92 year old who just got a new hip so he could play golf. <laughs> All right. Mm -hmm. And he's playing golf again. Um, so it's really figuring out what really matters to you. You had asked earlier, kind of in a medical vein, about how do you decide? And there is a website that I wish I I may be able to get you while we're on the, the, the chat uh, on the webinar, what it is. But if not, I certainly can get it to you afterwards. Um, okay. That talks about what really matters. And it gets people, it's, it's there to have you think about in terms of what do you want your medical care to do? But it's really, what, do you, what really matters to you? What do you want your life to be? And then it talks about your medical care and is it interfering or is it helping? You know, and it helps you kind of trim down to what are the important issues for you. But the first part is all about what really matters. Is it, you know, taking care of your health, it, you know, all of these health things and dealing with it? Is it your relationships? Is it being able to play, do things, go out? You know, what are the things that that make life worth living? Yeah, I, I know and there are several of them. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Yeah, there's one called Blue Zones. Uh, yeah, th there are a bunch Okay, I didn't know uh, about that. There are a lot of people out there that uh, that are in in that uh, line of work. I, you know, what can I consider doing uh, with myself, with my medical, with my health, with my yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, uh, what are some of the biggest things? This is a very broad question. Sorry. Uh, what are some of the biggest things that you have learned? from working with your patients over the years? You've seen 180-year-old, you've seen 180-year-old, okay? The variability is extraordinary, um, not just in personalities and resiliency and emotional tenor, but also in how, how they've ended up with their health at that point in their life. So. We actually in geriatrics now have started kind of stratifying people to help decide what makes sense medically. And it's looking at people and saying, are they robust? You know, are they fit? Um, would I, with certain exceptions, suggest that they do exactly what I would suggest a 65-year-old would be doing or a 50-year-old do, okay? Um, that their health is, is good. Um, do I think they're going to make it another 30 years? You know, something like that. And then there's a group that's kind of vulnerable. They're doing okay, but it's not going to take a lot for them to fall off, okay, and be less able to do what they're doing now. And usually those people have a lot of chronic diseases and have other things going on. Um, but they could go in either direction. They may end up in the fit category if you do certain things, or they may become frail. And the people who become frail are the ones who really don't do well with a lot of medical procedures. They get adverse effects of medications. You know, it's, they're people who might do better without the medical intervention. Not always, okay, but they might. 
So recognizing that all older people are not alike and what they want is not alike. Some people, they don't care. They want to live to be 120. Okay, not me, but there are people out there who want that. And then there are people who say, you know, this happens, I'm done. Okay, not that we can necessarily have them be done, but <laughs> we know what they want. All right. Um, so I think that's one of the biggest things I've learned. The second is the creativity that people have in terms of, I had one person who um, was a writer, obviously identified with the written word, kept doing it, wrote poetry, and then she started having word finding difficulties. She switched to collage. She started doing collages as her artistic endeavor and was wonderful at it, absolutely wonderful. But she realized, I had another person who was a tennis player, now she's a pickleball player, <laughs> you know. They realize they can't do what they did, but they find something to fill it in. Um, so I think the resiliency is, is the second. And the third is redefining, redefining what independence is. So um, I had always thought that my generation would be perfectly fine sharing homes when we got older because we shared them when we were younger and you know we had dorm rooms and all of that and houses that we shared and it turns out that's not so much the case everybody wants their own place they want to be independent in their own place and if we continue that way it's going to be really really hard to allow people to stay at home to age in place which is the ideal. Most people do not want to go to a facility, okay? But I think we're going to have to learn to do some sharing in order to do that. Um, and those are new things that are starting up. Um, and I see some of my patients embracing them and some of them saying, like the person I told you about, Helen, nope, not going to do any of it. So I think those are some of the things I've really seen. Excellent. This was really a wonderful interview. Thank you so much. So good to hear from you. Best wishes and best of luck with this wonderful book, Honest Aging, Dr. Roseanne Leipzig. And uh, uh, with that, we will uh, close our session. All Thank right. you very much. It really was yeah. fun. Yes, it was.